Hi, my name is Tim Carter, and this is a follow-up uh, presentation discussion, particularly on Matthew 19, 4 and Mark 10, 6. <clears throat> the question really is uh, dinosaurs or divorce, and yes, I, I enjoy uh, seeing what goes on out there, and meaning I enjoy that I've been called out from it and severed my ties like all those who are in one of the Lord's churches or may not yet have realized that through baptism we sever our ties from these things. We're, we're disciple makers, not dissonance makers. Uh, dissonance is a nicer way of saying disagreement. Uh, for example, in the Corne Commission that we are republishing now that <clears throat> it's becoming more useful, people find out that dead, construct-laden, flummox-filled dialogue is a form of anti-epistemology. An actual Corne conversation, on the other hand, seizes the hermeneutic advantage of a flummox-free, living and dynamic interpretation. Now, that is, what is the scripture itself speaking with and to us? <clears throat> now, this is not valuable. <laughs> Let's say if you're a constructor, and for example, in another presentation will evaluate the interpretations that have been commonly made about Romans 8 and 9 but you're really not interested in what the Bible's interested in if you like those chapters as um, let's say resource material for constructing dissonance and when we go through it and we evaluate how people intentionally interpret it to cause the greatest amount of dissonance, it's because there's a great economy in people's reaction, anti-reaction, uh, if you will. It's called anti-energy, I suppose, where they just have to uh, react against people and their interpretations. And then the problem occurs to them is that they don't really have a, a good interpretation, an anti interpretation is not necessarily a good interpretation either because the emotion overrides their cognitive thoughts but uh, the Spirit of Christ gives us composure that's fruit of the Spirit uh, so when we evaluate uh, like this case of a man named Ken Ham uh, we already demonstrated that he did not uh, follow the text how Yah come to be as a determinant and how could he know that uh, I don't expect hermeneutics uh, from people that build theme parks and things like that. So, uh, but what is uh, Mark 10, 6 and Matthew 19, 4 discussing? And here's my notes. I'll put these online eventually in a brochure format. So students who want to be discipled or disciple others, um, because it's really... Uh, one thing about religionists, we all know, there seems to be a little religion here in all of us. We seem to know what's best to teach people. We seem to know uh, when it's best to go along, play along. Uh, the problem is, that's Egyptianity. That's not Christianity. Uh, that's darkness. That's not light. Knowledge uh, doesn't presume to uh, impose itself on or against itself. So in Mark 10:6. This is a group of Pharisees, these religious people. And Jesus said, away from beginning of creation. Now this is all worded out. You can, you can still understand this in the uh, more advanced language, English language. Uh, there's two famous universities, Cambridge University and Oxford University, that have two distinctly different English Bibles they support they consider each one of them consider their version of the King James's Bible the best of course you know it's a Pepsi Coke question I suppose and so their brand of King James but these leading universities known renowned all over the world uh, you can use that but now that that's a that's a more difficult language than the commonly expressed language that the commoners accused according to the term baptized derided uh, would understand it. So I just word it out commonly and then help people like I use the uh, King James's version Oxford edition which I now have learned that's not the best one but I'll get there. Um, the Cambridge edition one day I will have uh, learned how to properly use it. So from now I'll just say in 
chapter 10, verse 6 of Mark. <clears throat> it says, But away from beginning of creation, he made them male and female. Now, when you diagram this, you can see just how it's really small. There's not a lot of data here. It's, it's just that it, it, will, it will occur to you when you're studying this why people really don't want to bring in Matthew 19, 4 and then collectively reason this out. It's just when you're making a proof text, you really don't have to think it out. And when you already have someone primed to go along with you, and this is what we teach our young people at Landmark here in Jacksonville, Arkansas, make sure, because going alongism will eventually take you somewhere from which you can't return. And we help a lot of people who really are thankful to come off the broad way, come back to the specific way that Christ gives us. But apparently this text is being used, and I, I'm not, again, I, I wouldn't even know how to expect Ken Ham and people who don't, aren't scripted by the text. If, if it's if it's not a church, which Answers in Genesis is not a church, so it's really not fair to expect from them that type of integrity. It's like uh, ridiculing a seminary for the standards you would expect from a church. Um, a seminary will have let's say it could have a diverse faculty with itself then being subject to judgments according to particular faculty members. That's really not a uh, fair standard. So you could never place the the standard of a church, which is the pillar and ground of the truth, the called out body of baptized believers who've agreed together for the purpose of carrying out the Great Commission, which is to be observing always all things which Jesus taught. This is Jesus. So Jesus or Ken Ham. That's really not a choice for me. It's not a choice for Christians. It's just, you know, people don't realize that if you allow someone to script the text rather than be scripted by it, you're following someone less than or other than. In Matthew 19, 4, it says that they did not read, and religionists don't read. In 19.4 it says, You did not read that the one who creates made them male and female away from beginning. The Bible does not say in beginning God created Adam and Eve. The Bible says in beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We've discussed this before, just that what happened is they, by switching the topic from divorce, they then can read and import eisegesis another topic which is now the age of the earth which now trumps Jesus topic so Jesus the master teacher uh, is having and I'll just use Ken Ham for example it's not intentional I, I doubt if he's um, I don't know Christians would willfully uh, this is called a negative externality it's something we did not foresee and that's why uh, we're always uh, careful when we receive feedback here, especially at I.M. Corne on behalf of Landmark Mission of Church. Uh, that's why we welcome dialogue and feedback. And we love when someone says, hey, we noticed you said feminine and it was masculine, or you said masculine and it was feminine, or you said singular and it was plural, or you said present tense and it was aorist tense, or it's present in this text, but in this and this and this text, it's actually aorist. Well, that's wonderful. That's actually... Um, people that are using the Bible as a text that it is. Most people don't recognize the Bible as a written document. Uh, the word scripture, the first word is script. And so it's hard to find people who will be scripted by it. That's why as disciple makers, it's a very unique task that Christ has given his churches. Or he has tasked us with this very unique word. And I'm honored to do it because Jesus is the smartest man I ever lived. He's smarter than Ken Ham. And I like that. I like that he's smarter than all these things that people conjure up, send out there, and it bodes well in commercial Christianity, but as far as commissional kingdom work, it doesn't really bode well. So the topic was switched. Uh, that's a problem. And here in 19.4, the term noun creation uh, was not used. It's the person who makes or creates, and he made them male and female. So the context here, uh, even though it was unintentional, uh, this this work of trying to use this text to prove something less important than that which the master was speaking, which anything other than the subject matter uh, presented by the master teacher would have to be subordinate. So to place age dating above the topic under discussion in the context, 
unintentionally calls into question Jesus' knowledge of the very creation. Did Jesus not know that in the beginning God, uh, it didn't say God created the heavens and earth? We said, well, yes, he had to know. He's the one through whom and by whom and without him, whom nothing came to be that ever came to be. So uh, that's just one of the uh, travesties that can happen. It's unintentional. And then, of course, now that people have been reviewing the um, fallible elements within young earth. I've never done that. I've only just begun it. It's not a problem. I don't mind evaluating Calvinism and publishing the fallible elements of it. Uh, all Calvinists know Calvinism is fallible, just not very many uh, want to disclose those fallible elements. Uh, and again, if you're a dissonance maker, you would like to conceal those things. And if you're a disciple maker, uh, as we, the Lord's Church, is here at Landmark Missionary Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Arkansas. We're glad to disclose fallible elements about rapturism, um, Arminianism, Molinism, Calvinism, and now Earth Ageism. Uh, so it's really it's, it's nothing we're uncomfortable with. Um, the Holy Spirit's here with us in this work. Christ said He would be with us always in partnership with this work of making disciples. He didn't say he'd be in partnership in dissonance making. So uh, Ken Ham and other things, when you move out into that broad way of commercial Christianity, constructs become very valued to generate. Uh, they become social currency. And you can really get a lot of social energy going and a lot of anti this, anti that, but it really isn't producing the improved epistemology and consult this I will, I'll get this back online but dialogue is a deliberate focused conversation engaged in intentionally with a goal of increasing mutual understanding through collaborative learning and this is by addressing problems and questioning thoughts or actions so if you run into someone and they say quote they're a young earther which that's a new thing really if, if they don't want to discuss it then they're allowing you, they're disclosing to you that they know that it won't uphold the, the evaluation of Scripture and it won't endure an intentional dialogue in which things are called into question. Today people just, you know, build a partition, sectarianism and, you know, it's these micro-denominations now. So you can come out from among them, say you're not Catholic or Protestant, say you're not Calvinist or Arminian, but then <laughs> just return to Egypt for nothing more than um, some category, new sub-micro denominational level of label, I guess. I don't know what it is to be a young earth landmark missionary Baptist freely associating with the American Baptist Association. That's, I didn't know I was uh, accused of an old, being old earther until that's what these people who wouldn't dialogue and enter into collective reasoning as Christians do and want to improve their knowledge. Um, so I would be alongside someone dying in the hospital, caring for uh, the sick, or preaching and teaching lessons, taking care of curriculum, counseling, uh, going on our outreach, engaging people that come here through our various uh, ministries in the church, But and then would be labeled while I'm still working. And so whoever these dissonance makers are, they certainly have found a, a target-rich environment that seems to be more than inclined or predisposed to uh, be anti the other and keep all this going. But uh, this is uh, a work of the Great Commission. Uh, churches are commissional, not commercial. And with that, you have a blessed day.